Okay, so good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so not sure how punctual should we be on order for the very first session in the morning, but I was just been reminded by the organizer to kick off. So <laughs> let us uh, uh, kick off. Um, so thank you very much for coming uh, to this uh, uh, deep dive workshop, uh, Industrial Decarbonization and Net Zero Transition Acceleration. Uh, my name is uh, Shuji Hashizume, a unit head of uh, structured uh, projects uh, at the uh, ADB. Um, I'm the moderator of uh, this uh, session. Um, hope you're um, enjoying uh, ASEF uh, for the first day, or some of you already uh, more two days, uh, if you're here since uh, Monday. Uh, obviously, we have been uh, covering uh, lots of uh, topics uh, um, in uh, this uh, forum including uh, renewable energy generation, energy efficiency, uh, grid, you name it. But in this session, we like to um, um, talk about the, um, things from a little bit different angle, which is uh, industrial decarbonization. So um, obviously our day-to-day -day life uh, rely on various uh, industrial products, uh, um, um, including iron and steel, chemicals, uh, concrete, cement, pulp, paper, food, and actually, um, uh, there is these sectors uh, um, combined uh, the source of approximately one third of the total um, greenhouse gas uh, emission. Uh, the figure could be slightly lower in uh, Asia, um, uh, but in any case, it's a huge uh, uh, proportion. So towards the net zero goal, we cannot just be talk talking about the um, uh, electricity or, or energy in a narrow sense. Uh, we should be accelerating uh, industrial decarbonization. Um, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, this is, uh, well, there's a growing interest, um, but still um, kind of uh, underserved uh, um, uh, area. Um, and uh, something uh, institution like ADB would like to ramp up. So that's the motive of this uh, session. And uh, um, we have, uh, we've invited uh, panelists uh, from industries think tank, uh, commercial bank, uh, capital market, and, and from uh, ADB internally uh, to discuss the options um, as well as challenges and uh, from the, both from the industrial side and the financing side uh, together like to uh, explore um, the innovative uh, um, options um, to contribute to um, ac accelerate industrial decarbonization. Um, but before going to the panel to set the stage, uh, um, we have invited uh, um, even more important uh, speaker uh, to, to learn from the company um, which uh, we all know. So uh, we have a, a keynote speech um, by uh, Mr. Jopi Chan uh, from Keppel. Um, so um, let me introduce uh, uh, Mr. Jopi. So Mr. Jopi Chan is the Chief Investment Officer infrastructure of Keppel Limited. Uh, prior to this, he was CEO of Keppel Infrastructure Fund Management, the trustee manager of Keppel Infrastructure Trust, Singapore's largest infrastructure business trust listed on the SGX. Mr. Chan has over 15 years of experience across infrastructure, private equity, and investment banking with more than 10 billion US dollar of transaction experience in developed and the emerging market. Uh, prior to joining Keppel, uh, Mr. Chan worked at Partners Group, um, Our Capita, and Barclays Capital, and was based in Hong Kong, London, and Singapore over the tenure of his, his career. Uh, he has a Master of Finance from the University of Cambridge and is a CFA charter holder. So, Mr. Jopi, um, yep, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, uh, very good morning to everyone, and thanks uh, so much to Shuji for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, incredibly honored and privileged to be here today. And um, just to kick things off, Keppel is a global asset manager and operator with deep operating capabilities in infrastructure, real estate, and connectivity. Headquartered in Singapore, Keppel operates in more than 20 countries worldwide providing critical infrastructure and services for clean energy, decarbonization, sustainable urban renewal, and digital connectivity. 
Keppel's unique developer, operator, manager model differentiates us from a typical financial investor. We are able to add value throughout the life cycle of the assets the group manages and operates, from the raising of private funds to invest into projects, to the development and operation of the projects or execution of asset enhancement initiatives, through to their stabilization and possible monetization through one of the listed REITs or the business trust managed by the group. To drive the group's integration as one company and to further accelerate growth, horizontal teams across business units have been established to evaluate opportunities in targeted asset classes, such as infrastructure, real estate, and data centers. Keppel currently manages an established international footprint of quality assets ranging from renewable energy platforms in countries such as Sweden, Norway, and Germany, to waste platforms in South Korea, and water treatment and chemical distribution facilities in Australia and New Zealand. Keppel's strong technical expertise and proven operating capabilities play a significant role in providing global solutions for the world's most pressing challenges. Zooming into Southeast Asia specifically, the industrial sectors in the region contributed approximately 25% of total CO2 direct emissions in 2021, and contributions from the industrial sector are expected to increase as the region continues to experience high population and economic growth. ASEAN economies have grown at an average of 5% GDP a year, while demand for electricity has surged to an annual average of 6%. According to CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, many economists expect the region to continue to expand at this rate through 2050 and triple their size over the next three decades. This map charts Southeast Asia's net zero future, with most of the region either commit committing to a net zero or an emissions reduction target. Presently, however, fossil fuel burning facilities continue to fire around 75% of Southeast Asia's electricity supply today, with coal fire powered plants continue accounting for more than 40% of the total. Coal will foreseeably continue to be a part of the region's immediate future, although these net zero commitments mean that major investments across solar, wind, and other renewables, as well as cleaner hydrocarbon sources will be necessary for the region. Singapore's key net zero initiatives, for instance, encapsulates well the key struggles that the region faces. These initiatives include tapping on regional power grids for increased access to cleaner energy sources, maximizing solar energy deployment by 2030, exploring emerging low carbon alternatives such as hydrogen, carbon capture, utilization and storage, and increasing the efficiency of gas fired power plants to reduce emissions. In line with Singapore's key initiatives, Keppel has been actively involved in supporting the nation's transition via a variety of projects. Given Singapore's physical and land constraints, it will be challenging for the country to be able to meet both its energy needs and its net zero target at the same time. As such, it is inevitable that Singapore looks outside in order to meet its climate goals. Keppel's energy portfolio is approximately 5.9 gigawatts, with renewables representing almost four gigawatts of production capacity as at the end of 2023. At the same time, Keppel is also currently in negotiations to source for reliable and sustainable energy sources in support of cross-border power trade in ASEAN. Earlier in 2022, Keppel's infrastructure division signed exclusive and binding agreements with Cambodia and Laos in addition to the commencement of the Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore Power Integration Project. The LTMS PIP saw Keppel import up to 100 megawatts of renewable hydropower from Laos in June 2022. This marked the first multilateral cross-border electricity trade involving four ASEAN economies. Similarly, Keppel received conditional approvals from the Energy Market Authority of Singapore for the long-term import and sale of one gigawatt of low carbon electricity from renewable sources in Cambodia and 300 megawatts from Indonesia to Singapore in 2023. With these agreements in place, Keppel expects to contribute 1.3 gigawatt of Singapore's four gigawatt low carbon electricity importation target. 
From a PV solar adoption perspective, Singapore's urban density presents opportunities for the integration of such PV technologies into existing buildings and infrastructure to reduce their overall carbon footprint. Keppel has been appointed by the Changi Airport Group to design, build, own and operate a large-scale PV system on the rooftops of Changi Airport's terminal buildings, auxiliary structures, airfield and cargo buildings for a period of 25 years. This PV system is expected to be complete by 2025 with the potential to reduce approximately 10% of CAG's 2019 carbon emissions. The Keppel infrastructure at Changi project represents the retrofitting of a decade-old asset into a positive energy building. The building will house more than 4,000 square meters of PV panels, which is expected to yield more than twice the building's energy consumption and a more than 245,000 kiloton reduction in CO2 emissions. Keppel has also commenced construction of Singapore's first hydrogen-ready CCGT plant. The Keppel Sakra Cogen plant is a 600 megawatt hydrogen-ready advanced CCGT project which is expected to achieve COD in Q1 2026. The plant will be equipped with Mitsubishi Power's latest J-series gas turbine, which is able to blend up to 30% hydrogen into its fuel mix currently, with a transition roadmap to 100% green hydrogen fuel by 2045. At the commencement, it is expected to offset 220,000 kilotons in CO2 emissions. Lastly, Keppel has also begun exploring emerging low-carbon solutions with leading industry players such as Viridor, ExxonMobil, PetroChina, and GreenCo as a means of staying ahead of the curve. As of today, we have, formed, uh, we have formed partnerships and kick-started collaborations with other industry players to advance technologies in the areas of carbon capture and storage, as well as alternative energy sources such as hydrogen, ammonia, and bioenergy. Certainly, the industrial decarbonization narrative in Southeast Asia is still in, in its infancy. And what has been presented here are just a few examples of how Keppel is supporting this transition in the region. I look forward to the upcoming panel discussion where we can explore in greater depth alternative means to better support the adoption of these emerging technologies. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions uh, if you have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jopi. Um, so, um, actually, he's not uh, joining the, the panel uh, discussion, and uh, we'll have our uh, interactive um, Q&A for the panel session separately. But if you have any questions to um, um, Mr. Jopi's uh, presentation, um, please feel free to ask now. So, maybe, uh, yes, please. Um, hi, my name is Gerald Han. I'm with Hitachi. Quick question on ammonia. You mentioned that you're looking at a pilot project on, on ammonia. What is the um, off taker on that? How are you planning to use that? Yes, so uh, what we're exploring right now is uh, multimodal uh, importation of hydrogen and, and ammonia for our facilities in Singapore. Uh, so the envisaged off taker for that would be our electricity retailer in Singapore. Uh, Keppel Electric, where we are a bit of a integrated uh, gen tailor, where we own the upstream production facilities, um, but we also own the uh, midstream and distribution uh, capabilities via the electricity retailer. So the off-taker would be the electricity retailer, Keppel Electric. Good morning. My name is Herbert Lubis from Indonesia. My first question is uh, Singapore is uh, uh, interested to import power from Indonesia, particularly solar floating from Batam Island, which is connected to Jurong, if I'm not mistaken. And the requirement is a uh, base load 24 seven in which this PV must be supported by maybe long duration energy storage. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the neighborhood island like Indonesia, 
like uh, Sumatra Island, uh, it has a very, very large uh, uh, source of hydropower, meaning that we can explore importing power from palm hydro energy storage to Singapore via HVDC. And then if we have enough in the island for local uh, requirement, then we can imp export to Jurong. And can you explain a little bit about the requirement in Singapore? Because in Singapore, you have EMA, Energy Market Authority. Like in Indonesia, we have PPA contract 25 years. But in Singapore, maybe uh, one month, two months based on market uh, requirements. Could you please ex uh, ex uh, what do you call, elaborate the requirement from Singapore as a users as well as from the regulatory uh, requirements? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for, for the question. Uh, first of all, I, I must preface this that uh, I'm not from the regulator, uh, so I'll share uh, what I know um, based on uh, our participation uh, in the energy importation uh, approval that was provided by the EMA, the regulator to, to Keppel. Uh, so Keppel has secured 300 megawatts out of uh, one gigawatt of uh, energy importation from uh, Indonesia. Uh, and you're right that the idea is for this to be firm the uh, capacity. Uh, so what we're exploring right now is uh, looking for suitable partners uh, within the uh, Southern Islands uh, located uh, south of Singapore, uh, including uh, places like uh, Rampang, where solar PV facilities, uh, not, not floating, uh, ground mounted, will be installed uh, together with uh, BESS uh, systems. However, the need for it to be 100% firm does mean that uh, it will be uh, upsized quite significantly. Uh, for instance, if you were looking at 300 megawatts and if you were to apply a capacity factor of call it 15% in that particular location, you'd be upscaling it by quite a number uh, of, of multiples. Um, but the, I think the most important thing is uh, to your question also about the PPA duration. Um, and as I explained earlier, Capital uh, Electric uh, as the electricity retailer Will, will stand behind the PPA for a suitably long duration, potentially uh, 25 years also. And the idea is that uh, as an integrated firm with real estate and data centers, we're able to source uh, the downstream customers. Um, as you know, Singapore has very strict requirements for any new data centers that are constructed on the island, uh, requiring 100% green energy. Um, and therefore, the idea is to have you know back-to-back -back offtake arrangements from such uh, cloud players uh, all the way to to the upstream facilities, and thereby significantly de-risking uh, the the project. But the long and short is that Capital Electric, as a retailer, will stand behind the the upstream uh, importation from Indonesia. Perhaps okay, yeah. Last question before moving on to the panel session. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Dungai of Green Energy Development Corporation. I just would like to know the details of your PPA or offtake agreement of the Changi Airport for a 43 megawatt peak solar. Uh, how, how many years really have you established that first question? Then second is, have you been definitive about the rate per kilowatt hour, payable, and see if you have 25 years of takeoff agreement, payable based on the estimated number of kilowatt hours per year, or it is based on whatever is the act to uh, all generation of the solar. So mm. can you give me a little bit about how you manage this? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the infrastructure at Changi project is a uh, design, build, own, operate uh, initiative. Um, I am not uh, at liberty to share uh, some of these uh, information related to the PPA. Uh, because, uh, as you probably know, uh, the Singapore CNI solar market is, is a competitive market. 
Um, but the long and short is, um, again, uh, similar to the prior two questions, Capital Electric, uh, as the electricity retailer, has that ability to manage uh, the potential spread in terms of electricity power prices. And uh, it is the counterparty that stands behind the PPA uh, with the Changi Airport Group. <laughs> one last, okay, one last one. Thank you very much, Alan Aguinaldo from Tractable Engineering. I understand that uh, your project in the in the Philippines are are uh, <clears throat> is only one. Are you considering additional uh, RE project in the Philippines in the next several years? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, so, so in the Philippines, uh, we own a, a storage uh, facility in Subic Bay, and uh, we most certainly would be keen to continue to do more, uh, particularly on the renewable energy side of things. Uh, with the storage facility, it's the largest uh, petroleum import and, and storage with 6 million barrels of capacity, um, but we're also looking uh, at initiatives to uh, expand the tank capacity and to store uh, sustainable uh, aviation fuels uh, as, as we continue to, to look uh, towards uh, further asset enhancement initiatives. And there's uh, quite a lot of land that we own in, in that region where we're also exploring you know, the uh, inclusion of um, renewable energy to further uh, supplement the business as well. Okay, yep. thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jopi. Thank so you. Can you Yeah, lots of topics already, greening the grid, um, hydrogen, Siandai rooftop, uh, EMAs, uh, Renewable Energy Import Initiative, perhaps uh, each of them would uh, merit a uh, um, separate uh, session, but uh, in, in the interest of time, uh, let's uh, move on to the panel um, session. And we have uh, five uh, uh, panelists, so um, I'm taking the liberty of not uh, reading out the, um, all the bios, but uh, um, let me introduce the uh, the panel. So the first panelist is uh, Mr. Uh, Pek Hun Chun uh, from Steel Asia. Um, uh, Mr. Chun is, uh, um, has uh, over 20 years of valuable experience in the steel manufacturing industry. Um, he worked at Nut Steel Holdings uh, um, before, um, where he was uh, senior vice president and head of the metallics conversion division, then became managing director at TSN Wires. Um, uh, in the Siam Industrial um, Wire, and since 2019, uh, he's been uh, a Chief Technical Officer at the Steel Asia uh, Manufacturing uh, Corporation, uh, Mr. Chon. <laughs> Our second speaker is from uh, World Resources uh, Institute, uh, Ms. Clorinda Wibowo. Um, Clorinda serves as a senior manager for the energy and sustainable business program at WRI Indonesia. In her nine years of uh, um, experience at uh, WRI Indonesia, she has been active in promoting decarbonization and energy transition in the industry and commercial sectors through policy research, multi-stakeholders, collaboration, and technical assistance to cooperation from various business sectors. Uh, Ms. Clorinda, please. <clears throat> then uh, we have our uh, uh, panelists from the, the financial sector, Ms. Uh, Yin Yin Chen, um, a Director of Transition Finance of Standard Chartered Bank. Um, Yin Yin has uh, over 15 years of experience in the energy sector. Her focus at the Standard Chartered uh, covers key industrial decarbonization solutions such as CCS, low carbon hydrogen, green steel, um, she also plays an active role in developing carbon finance options to support the growth of high integrity carbon projects. Uh, Ms. Yin. <laughs> then uh, um, another guest from the capital market side, Ms. Meji Eloy uh, from Climate Bond Initiative. Uh, she's a senior technical analyst at uh, CBI. Um, she has assisted in delivering over 270 billion US dollar user proceeds uh, debt instruments. 
that they're consistent with the goal of uh, uh, limiting the limiting global warming, um, uh, working across a variety of sectors from renewable energy, low carbon buildings, low carbon transport, and more recently transition of the hard to abate sectors such as steel, cement, hydrogen, and basic uh, chemicals, uh, Ms. Uh, Meiji. For some reason, uh, Tristan, as my colleague, uh, um, I don't. I have a separate uh, bio. Um, so, Tristan um, knows he's a senior investment specialist, blended finance, and the team lead of uh, uh, blended finance uh, and the parallel donor fund activities. Uh, uh, previously, he was uh, um, um, uh, leading uh, uh, ADB's private sector infra team um, in uh, um, based in Bangkok and was part of the origination team uh, for infrastructure finance, uh, mainly uh, renewable energy and other climate finance uh, projects. Uh, prior to ADB, Tristan was an associate director at the Clean Energy Finance Corporation uh, Green Bank uh, uh, for Australia that was established to facilitate increased flows of finance into the clean energy uh, sector, uh, Tristan. So, yep, please uh, welcome the, the panelists. Uh, can you all uh, come to the... <clears throat> Thank you. So I, I do have some order in mind, but uh, nevertheless. Um, so what what I what I've uh, asked the panelists is uh, um, I've asked uh, um, the the question of key topics uh, um, for each uh, panelist uh, to to talk about. So um, go uh, one by one for the first round, then uh, we can continue with uh, follow on questions. So I like to start with the, the industry because that's the main character for the, the industrial decarbonization. So. Um, uh, Peck, um, can you perhaps uh, um, at first uh, share your perspective from the industry? What is uh, Steel Asia, the largest steel company in the Philippines, uh, doing for decarbonization with some example technologies and, and, and so on? Thank you. Yeah, next, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you, Shuji, for the invitation. Um, to share Steel Asia's perspective in our decarbonization journey. A short introduction of Steel Asia. We are the leading uh, steel company in the Philippines, producing uh, rebar since 1965. Um, we actually have close to 50% market share in the country, and uh, generally, we are the preferred suppliers of uh, contractors, um, developers in the Philippines. Um, so we have plants uh, in different major islands in the Philippines, uh, altogether six rolling mills, uh, one milk shop, and we have downstream construction uh, services uh, in these locations. But I must say that the uh, Philippines is actually not a big steel producing country. Yeah, and uh, this also leads to the next part, uh, Steel Asia. We see our vision as uh, helping to lead uh, to develop the Philippine steel industry. What we have in the Philippines today is really just reinforcing steel bars uh, manufacturing, but what we hope to see at Steel Asia is the Philippines being able to make a variety of steel needed for the country's uh, infrastructure and industrial development. Coming to the part about steel decarbonization. It's very much a technology-centric um, technology matter. You can see um, there are three major steel producing technologies. The first one is generally called the blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace route. This uses uh, a lot of carbon, uh, not to burn, but to actually remove um, the oxides from the iron ore. So this actually generates uh, 2.3 on the average, global average, 2.3 tons of uh, carbon dioxide for every ton of steel made. And we have the second, uh, second process in the middle of the screen. Uh, this is called the direct reduc uh, reduce ion uh, process. Generally on the global average scale, uh, it generates 1.4 tons of CO2 per ton of steel. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, we actually have the scrap EAF route. EAF stands for electric arc furnace. This is a recycling route. Um, and on a global average basis, it generates 0 0.7 tons of CO2 per ton of steel. Yeah, but, in, but there is not enough scrap in the world to make all the steel that the world needs. So hence, um, what the world is uh, producing a lot today is using the BFBOF route on the left side. And you can see that as a result, the global average is actually 1.9 ton of CO2 per ton of steel. So steel, unfortunately, has the unenviable un, uh, position of being classified as a hard to abate sector for decarbonization uh, to achieve the net zero uh, global climate goals. Okay, so how has the industry responded? Um, different technologies have, uh, have been developed. Um, some of them are newer, some of them are more traditional. But you can see the highest out there on the average is the blast furnace BOF route, 2.3 tons of CO2 per ton of steel. But it goes down the ladder and you can see the ones at the bottom of the page uh, generates 0.3 to 0.4 tons of CO2 per ton of steel. Um, this actually means that we can potentially reduce more than 80, 85, 87% of the CO2 generation if we choose the right technology. But you will also see some common traits at the bottom of the page. Yeah, the common traits are, in general, um, the technologies will have to involve renewable energy. So availability of economically viable Renewable energies are quite key to decarbonize the steel industry. And renewable energy will allow the generation of green hydrogen because if we convert everything to hydrogen, but they are all made uh, using coal-fired power plants, um, it doesn't help there uh, so much uh, in terms of reaching our, our climate goals. Yeah. But last but not least, uh, also the carbon capture, utilization and storage technologies another set of emerging technologies that we hope to be advancing uh, very fast and also to, to be feasible uh, for extensive uh, applications in the future. So Steel Asia actually has selected the scrap EAF route technology plus renewable energy. And this actually enabled us to reduce not to 0.7 tons of CO2 of, uh, per ton of steel, but actually 2.3 tons of CO2 per ton of steel, um, making our steel pretty green. And generally, how do we assess our current uh, manufacturing investment strategies? Um, because Philippines is not a major steel producing country and producing mainly rebars, we are uh, investing into uh, long products uh, steel for construction and industrial application. We are doing that also for um, the development of the steel industry in the country because we are generally substituting imports which are carried over thousands of kilometers away uh, from the Philippines, uh, of course generating a lot of CO2 both at the source of manufacturing plant plus the shipping uh, that gets them to the Philippines. We are also adopting one of the lowest uh, CO2 uh, uh, emission steel manufacturing technologies, which I mentioned just now, the scrap EAF plus renewable energy, making it very sustainable. We are re also recycling local scrap. Yeah, look, Philippines generate um, quite a substantial amount of local scrap. Um, actually, the excess scrap is still exported out of the country today. And then, the, on the other hand, Philippines imports a lot of steel. So we are also going to green the whole supply chain if we are utilizing the local resources available in the country, which is the steel scrap. And of course, for the country, for the economy, uh, we are helping the country to reduce billions of uh, uh, foreign exchange. Um, as a result, we are really talking about improving sustainability beyond just CO2. One thing that helps us in the Philippines is the government also has a very ambitious target to achieve um, high levels of renewable energy mix in the portfolio. So the target of the Philippine government is actually 35% renewable energy by 2030, 50% renewable energy by 2040. That is by far one of the most ambitious um, in the region, if not the world. 
Okay, where are our investments in the green steel? You can see that they are not just around Manila, they are all over the country, in Luzon, in Visayas, in Mindanao. When these are completed in the next few years, Steel Ages uh, green steel projects can reduce about 5.2 million tons of uh, CO2 per year. That's about 27% 20, of the current approximately 19 million tons of CO2 per year generated from Philippines and steel consumption. Other green projects involve our circular economy partnerships, our solar energy drive, raising the st green steel output in our plants, green water harvesting, and so on and so forth. Examples of how we are trying to drive sustainability. With that, thank you for allowing me to share the presentation. Then uh, we hope that this forum enables us to, to seek even uh, better ideas uh, to decarbonize and to, make, to achieve our climate goals. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Peck. Um, let's continue on the industry side. Um, um, so, Florinda, I um, understand that uh, World, uh, World RI has uh, undertaken a um, study on a coal boiler replacement in, in Indonesia. So, can you share the results of your study? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, very honored to be invited uh, to speak here representing WIA Indonesia. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, WIA Indonesia first. Uh, just a quick one slide. WIA Indonesia is an independent research organization. Uh, we're working on uh, the nexus of sustainable development and also environmental uh, protection. Uh, and we're working on several uh, issues. Uh, and, and now uh, my team is uh, working on the energy and sustainable business program. Um, and why we are focusing um, on industrial decarbonization since 2016 is uh, because if we look at the uh, emission breakdown of um, Indonesia emission, uh, we break it down into several sectors, energy, waste, industrial processes, uh, agriculture, forestry, and other land use. But if we look at the source of the emissions itself, um, majorly 7 74.5% uh, are actually related to industrial activities. And the rest of it, 25.5% uh, uh, are individual emissions, uh, which our consumption patterns is actually very much influenced by the industrial uh, com commodities itself. So therefore, if uh, Indonesia wants to achieve the energy transition, the climate transition, then the industry needs to be transition as well as priority. And we see uh, the industrial industry sectors in Indonesia already realize the future risk if they uh, from the climate crisis itself. So we divide it into physical risk and also transition risk. Where physical risk, many of these industry already started to realize that they they have um, assets that being impacted by the climate crisis as well. Like many factories uh, in in uh, uh, in several areas in Indonesia already getting flooded uh, when rainy seasons, um, and also other uh, challenge uh, physical challenges uh, that they're uh, 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 facing right now. And also transition risks that also coming from um, the policies, for example, uh, the future policies on the carbon uh, tax. And right now, uh, there are already uh, carbon cap um, reg uh, regulations also in Indonesia uh, that right now uh, are only impacting the power and also mining sectors. But in the future, um, it's going to impact all sectors of the industries itself. So there are transition risks there, and also uh, looking into the uh, consumers' demand also of, uh, where many of these industries are also looking into how uh, they can tap into uh, more sustainable uh, consumers, uh, be it in national market or national international market. And in Indonesia, uh, tapping into that uh, demand from the private sectors, uh, we established uh, two initiatives. Uh, first is CADIN. CADIN is Indonesia Chamber of Commerce. So we work together with uh, CADIN to build this net zero hub as a knowledge centers uh, for national companies to learn uh, and implement and help them how to implement the industrial decarbonizations. Uh, but basically we help them into uh, four stages of industrial decarbonization. Uh, first is uh, how uh, they can calculate their GHG emissions because you cannot uh, reduce what you don't know. 
So you need to understand where your emission come from and then setting up the target of the uh, net zero or climate target uh, and then building the strategy how to achieve the target and finally how to disclose the progress to avoid greenwashing. And CIA, uh, Clean Energy Investment Accelerator, is uh, one of the oldest initiatives since 2016, focusing on uh, the energy transition. And this initiative also already um, successfully uh, influenced the utility company in Indonesia, PLN, uh, where uh, PLN finally realized that th there's a big demand of um, uh, renewable energy from coming from the industrial sectors. And in 2019, uh, we established the uh, uh, PLN uh, successfully launched the first renewable energy certificate uh, to accommodate the demand from uh, the private sectors. And then if you look at the energy consumption from the industries, um, mostly, of course, most of the emission coming from the uh, heavy manufacturing sectors. Uh, but if you look at uh, the red graphic um, where you see most of the energy use are actually from uh, in the form of heat compared to electricity. In general, it's 80% of the er energy use is in the form of uh, heat, be it from the uh, heavy or light manufacturing sector. Um, so we also um, focusing on how we can uh, build like more, um, how we can build more solutions in terms of uh, uh, providing clean heat to these uh, companies. Because if we talk about the electricity, it's as straightforward as how the utility can provide more uh, renewable electricity and how they, the companies can access um, on-site generations like solar panel, for example. But in terms of the heat, the, the solution is very much limited, as you can see on the right side. Um, not many of the solutions actually already uh, available. And um, if we, and we did a survey to these companies uh, of Cardinal Zero Hub and CIA, where um, many of the solutions of uh, the heat uh, from ranging from the renewable gas or green hydrogen, actually for, uh, heat from clean sources, biomass, um, and others uh, are, are not very much uh, implemented yet in Indonesia. Uh, right now, most of the industries um, looking into uh, biomass as one of the replacement. Um, as you can see as the, in the graph right now, uh, we observe like several um, technology solutions. Uh, and if we talk about the low to medium uh, heat temperature um, that, that mostly used in the uh, light manufacturing sectors like textiles and also food and beverages, uh, the ultimate solution is actually electrification in the future. But if you look at the price of the electric uh, boiler right now, it's still very, very high in terms of the capex and also the opex from the uh, the price of the electricity compared if they're using a coal-based boiler. Um, so we look at biomass as transitional technology before they reach into fully electrification right now because um, the source is, is very much abundant in Indonesia. Uh, and sometimes the, the and most of the time the company they, they don't really need to change the technology of the boiler they need to just fuel switch uh, from coal to to biomass um, however um, in one of uh, our project uh, here we we uh, collaborate with one of the textile company or factory uh, to to implement 100% um, shift from the coal to biomass uh, from Kajuput is the, um, uh, from one of the agricultural waste. Um, and we see a lot of concern in terms of um, the, the sustainability of the feedstock or the availability of the feedstock across Indonesia. Um, although the, the feedstocks is abundant, but they cannot uh, really uh, ensure um, uh, it's, it's, it will be stable for a long term. Uh, and secondly, is still on the sustainability aspect of the biomass itself. Uh, so right now we're working with the Minister of Energy to build the sustainability indicators of the biomass itself so uh, the companies can be as confident as possible to utilize the, the biomass. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clorinda. Um, so now um, we have heard from the, the steel industry as well as uh, potentially um, uh, replacing uh, um, boilers with clean heat uh, solutions. Um, 
would like to move on to the finance side. So in, in um, your other, um, you're from the uh, SC's uh, transition finance team. So um, what is the, the focus uh, of uh, um, your team uh, from as a commercial bank focused on transition finance? And uh, have you, are you seeing uh, supporting uh, like their decarbonization like uh, what uh, we have just heard uh, um, in other markets? Uh, can you share your experience? Sure, thank you, Suji. Since I'm not going to use any slides, perhaps I just remain here. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Yin from Standard Chartered Bank. Thank you very much for having me here today. So certainly, uh, I'll be delighted to share with you the insights into our focus and coverage of the transition finance team at Standard Chartered. But actually, before doing that, I also want to take the opportunity to share a little bit about myself, right? Um, so I started my career in the energy sector. I was an engineer. I moved to commercial role, looking after the upstream overseas transactions for Sinopec. Then my journey also progressed with the industry's shifting of focus from oil to gas when I actually joined Mitsubishi Corporation, working on investment into the LNG value chain. So with Mitsubishi, I spent quite some time, almost two years, trying to develop this uh, gas receiving project in Pakistan. It's not an easy country. Uh, the project uh, did not materialize. There's a couple of reasons. Most apparent one is because uh, when COVID started, gas price became super volatile. So, but that experience gave me a very valuable insights of the complication of energy transition. Um, when the team was in Karachi, we, we have um, a base in a relatively affluent neighborhood. So like every other house on the street, right, we do have a backup generator in the backyard. So every night when power cuts happened, um, the air conditioner in my room stopped blowing for a few seconds before the generator came online. So this thing happened uh, almost every night when I was there for a week. It actually made me start to thinking about, okay, how we can address this uh, very pressing issue of getting affordable energy supply, but uh, also trying to minimize the environmental impact. I think this is a particular challenge in some of the less developed economies. So after Mitsubishi, I joined Standard Charter, not because of uh, the Pakistan experience is not that fancy, but rather I want to understand what type of role financial institutions can play in embracing energy transition. So the team I work with is called Transition Finance. Um, the objective of our team is really to work together with our products partners in the bank to provide our sector experience insights and what we understand about these transitional technologies. So I think net zero energy transition goes really beyond renewable capacity. I think all the speakers have already alluded in their um, early speaking that um, um, if everything turns into solar, it's not really mean that we can get to net zero, right? First of all, um, even for the power sector, actually in order for us to better utilize the renewable electricity, we need a more resilient, more flexible network. So that means investment into um, energy storage, investment into a long clock base load generated by low carbon fuel, like hydrogen, like ammonia, as well as perhaps CCUS. And secondly, when we look at uh, industrial emissions, as in Suji pointed out, it contributes to about one third of global emissions. Uh, electrification is good, but ele electrification is not going to decarbonize the entire industries. Right. We talked about steel sectors, blast furnaces. Um, it is emission from the process. And another example is perhaps um, uh, cement sector. So more than two thirds of cement emissions come from cement clean when we are making the clinkers. So that is a uh, chemical process emissions. By electrifying the clean, I don't think it's able to change that emissions. So here we are talking about a new way of manufacturing. And also, that leads actually to the last point I would like to discuss is really about, um, we know with today's available technologies, there will be residual emissions that will still be there. So that means we really need to roll out uh, negative emission solutions. Perhaps some of you already heard about things like CCUS, direct air capture, BEX, basic bioenergy with CCS. And also, I think very interestingly, as you mentioned about biomass, so um, this technology called pyrolysis is attracting more market attention, right? What it does essentially is really um, turn biomass into solid char. 
but it does not only stop there. It's not only a technology of sequestered carbon. Actually, biomass brings um, great benefit to agriculture sector. And also, since the process is an autosomal process, it releases a lot of heat. So I think that perhaps can help you on the clean heat program. So I hope this uh, gives you some uh, broad understanding of um, what uh, the team is working on and uh, what we are up to. Very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, Nin. Um, I, I think you have really so, um, a lot of very important points. So yeah, let's uh, get back to those. Um, OK, so um, next, uh, um, Maggie from uh, CBI. Um, so um, CBI, as well as yourself personally, has a lot of uh, experience and track record in uh, supporting uh, climate bonds. Now, climate bonds, perhaps we tend to imagine um, something in connection to renewable energy. But for the uh, discussion of this session, can you share uh, what the uh, CBI is doing in the area of industrial decarbonization and uh, what the, the criteria for um, industrial decarbonization to be eligible for um, your certification? Thanks. Sure. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Uh, so at Climate Bonds, we do a variety of things, but in particular for industry, we focus on sector criteria development. So we've got criteria for basic chemicals, cement, hydrogen and steel. And the way we create this criteria is we have two different working groups. So we first have the technical working group. So this is the scientists, the professors, the people who know the science of how to get to 1.5. They're the ones telling us this is an in an ideal world, this is what the industry would look like to lower their emissions. But then we have the industry working group, who I think on the panel we've actually worked with some um, of the companies here. And the industry working group, they're saying, OK, great, we understand the science, but this is what's actually possible. This is what we can do with the financing that's out there, with the technology that's out there. And with those two groups, we create a criteria which should be feasible and achievable for the industry to then take on. Then we also do market research. So we actually track all of the labeled debt that's out there in the market. So that's your green bonds, social bonds, sustainability links bonds, so, um, sustainability bonds. And we have a database that we store all of that in there and we check it against our methodology to check, is this actually best practice in this sector? And finally, we work with policy. This might be one of the most important aspects actually for the industry because without policy, it's really difficult to move ahead with low carbon. So we've actually released a paper called um, 101 Sustainable Finance Policies. And this is 101 ideas that we're giving to policymakers of how to decarbonize for a low carbon economy. I want to show you this graph from the IPCC. I find it quite scary actually, because it's showing what business as usual, the emissions trajectory that we're going to, and that's not great. Then we see the NDCs. It's a bit lower than business as usual, which is good. But it's still not ideal. It's not going to get us to even a two degree warming world. So actually, I just want to show you this graph to say, look how much emissions we need to lower to actually get to 1.5. And that's what we do at Climate Bonds. With the sector criteria that we develop, we create these pathways which shows you for cement, for basic chemicals, for steel, for hydrogen, what do you need to do to get to net zero by 2050? Of course, we consider that not every country is equal. A developing country versus, or, or an emerging market versus a developed country won't be at the same starting level. So we do have actually different starting points, but the goal is the same to be at net zero by 2050. And with this, so this graph you can see here is for our cement criteria. And we've got this for all of the criteria that we have. And in this criteria, we say, okay, what are the things you can do to get to net zero? And as we've rightly pointed out, it's not just about electrifying the grid, it's a variety of things. So we suggest all of these different aspects that you can incorporate into your industry to get to net zero by 2050. And then on our market research, so this is the labeled debt in the industrial sectors. So you can see, 
how much label debt, how much debt has been issued so far that's been labeled that we've captured. And so far, the labeled bond market is at 4.5 trillion, which is a lot considering it's a very relatively nascent market and it's growing exponentially. However, I want you to see how big the bond market is in general. The overall bond market is at 140 trillion. This should get you excited because it's showing you, look how much finance is out there to help you to decarbonize. There's so much opportunity out there and at Climate Bonds, we want to help along that journey to mobilize finance to the sustainable market instead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, so last but not least, uh, we are doing this session at ASF at the ADB because uh, ADB is also interested in this area or like on the case to scale up. So Tristan, now uh, what is there, um, are we uh, doing in this space? And if you have already reaction to what the other speakers have said, uh, can you share yeah. your thoughts? Thanks, Shuji. Uh, no, I'm, I'm learning a lot. So I was taking some photos of a few of those slides as I saw uh, lots of people in the audience were. So I, I think for ADB, obviously, and, and specifically myself and Shuji, we work in the private sector side of ADB. So we're lending to private sector companies you know, for projects or, or corporate capex um, where there's a development outcome. And I guess historically we've been very active in the power sector uh, and sort of infrastructure more traditionally. Uh, we've done a lot of transport investments and also in climate, we've done a lot of agribusiness investing. Um, we've been doing some work recently to look at, you know, we, we've, we kind of have this ambition now to be the climate bank of Asia and the Pacific and to invest 100 billion cumulatively across our sovereign and our sort of non-sovereign uh, operations by 2030. So we've been doing some work to look at what, what are the areas that we could be more active in if we're going to take a sort of more holistic view of decarbonisation. And industrial uh, decarbonisation obviously came up as a, a key sector where we can do more. I think the, the reason, part of the reason we probably haven't done more to date is for the very excellent reasons and uh, explanations that the other speakers have outlined, that it is a challenging sector uh, some of the technological solutions are just not ready yet. They're not sort of bankable or the costs haven't come down enough to incentivize the switching. Um, I, I understand and, and look, we're still learning about this sector. So um, take everything I say with it in, in the spirit of we're on a journey ourselves to actually understand the sector and how we can support it. But it, it can be a very low margin business. Um, so that makes the risk of switching much higher for the sector. There, there's also very few demand drivers. And I think if, if you look at, say, renewable energy, um, the big shifts in renewable energy have come from demand drivers and targets for renewable energy and then, you know, PPAs and underlying revenue models. So I think a lot of this has to come from the revenue and demand side. And until we see that, uh, which should eventually then scale up the technology implementation, which should result in cost reductions, I, I don't think you'll see a significant scaling up of these solutions. So we're at this kind of nascent stage where we need to kind of catalyze uh, more action in industrial decarbonization. Um, uh, and so that's why, you know, ADB is the Climate Bank of Asia and the Pacific. They're sort of exploring how we can do that, not only in the private sector side, but also in our sort of sovereign and what we call kind of upstream and midstream, which is really about working with governments on policies and the enabling environment. Um, a few other sort of remarks. I mean, we, we're we working with, uh, we, we think tools like blended finance will be very important in these kind of new sectors for the reasons I've just mentioned, that the costs aren't there yet, the, the concerns around switching and bankability are still there for the sector. Uh, so we're working with partners, not only the sort of bilateral partners we work with on blended finance, but also partners like the Climate Investment Funds. So Climate Investment Funds is sort of an over 10 year old uh, uh, sort of climate financing, multilateral climate financing facility. It's a bit like the precursor to the Green Climate Fund. They historically supported sectors like renewable energy and ADB, including the team in Thailand, uh, used uh, CIF money to blend alongside ADB's money to support some of the first uh, wind and solar projects in Thailand. SIF, uh, and we're seeing other donors now uh, express their support and, and intention to support industrial decarbonization. So I think we should see more concessional capital uh, become available for industrial decarbonization, which should help um, to catalyze some of this investment. 
Uh, we're also looking at establishing technical assistance programs um, just to support uh, you know, the knowledge uh, and also the sort of due diligence work we need to do in these new areas. Um, I think there's kind of, uh, let me find, I was writing some notes down just earlier, but I think there's sort of four ingredients for ADB to contribute to a, a, an area like industrial decarbonisation. The first is, of course, understanding. We need to understand the sector, we need to understand the technologies. Uh, so when we sit down with clients and, and the sector, we know what kind of capex we can and should be supporting that will have a real development impact and that will also be you know, bankable and commercially sustainable. Um, and that's why I guess events like this are important. Our, interestingly, our procurement department, I don't know if anyone from the room, uh, from our procurement department is in the room, but our procurement department ran an event uh, a couple of weeks ago on industrial decarbonisation. So I think it was really interesting to see that uh, that procurement side, uh, which is uh, not something I've historically seen, I'm not sure if uh, others have seen it, but our procurement department running a knowledge event on industrial decarbonisation, um, because I think that recognition that the demand side is going to be really important. Uh, I think the second factor is, of course, technical assistance. Um, this is to support clients on their journey and also on our own due diligence when we're entering a new sector. Uh, blended finance, uh, another critical component of uh, what we need to support. And also, of course, eventually, you know, we need to develop client relationships. We've got very good client relationships in the power sector. Uh, we've got, you know, very good uh, relationships in the electric mobility and the agribusiness sector. We're just getting started with industrial decarbonisation and of course, banking and, and support for transition is about long-term partnerships and relationships. So I think we need to build those uh, relationships with the industry. So I'll stop there and happy to discuss more with the panel. Thanks, Shuji. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tristan. So I, I think lots of interesting uh, points have been uh, raised so obviously business as usual um wouldn't work and uh, something like blended finance would be needed but perhaps uh, uh, we can discuss how um in the interest of time and to save some time for q a um perhaps i can uh, combine this the second and third question uh, um, which i've shared uh, um, with the panelists in advance so like to um uh, talk about the, the challenges and the potential solution so um what is uh, um, one of the things that has been uh, highlighted is uh, um, the, uh, the connection between the individual technology and the uh, uh, grid. I think uh, that was, uh, uh, Jopi has also mentioned the greening of the grid, and uh, um, Peck has also uh, mentioned the uh, uh, EF plus greening of the grid will bring to 85, 87% uh, uh, reduction. But Inin said uh, that the solar um, alone would not uh, um, uh, do. So perhaps to start from uh, Pekka, from the industry's viewpoint, um, how much are you, um, how much would you be relying on the external infrastructure such as greening of the grid and how much can you do uh, um, as your own investment to make a carbon um, emission reduction and what would be the, the, the biggest challenge for you to go for the, the greening uh, investment can you share some some sorts of okay thank you shuji that's a few questions combined into one um so i think decarbonization is not something any single company organization can do alone eh? i think we all recognize that so it's really a combined effort um i think in in a steel company like like steel asia uh, we probably can, you know, support the investment of our own um, new plant construction, our own plant upgrading with, with some level of um, like rooftop panels and some levels of um, um, energy efficiencies to, to help bring down our, our uh, carbon emission. But I think uh, we have to definitely work with um, the power supplier partners who can also you know from the power generation side from the grid side who also do the investments uh, together yeah so that you know more renewable energies can come in come into stream and uh, can be used for both um, generating green hydrogen can be used for ensuring that the whole um, the whole value chain is is more green 
For example, uh, Steel Asia has uh, six plants. Um, two of our plants are 100% renewable energy, but we can't do that on our own also. We are contracting with a geothermal power plant and they can supply all our needs. Yeah. So we believe this model is probably more sustainable because we can see that the renewable energy sector has even greater access to, to development or to project financing than the steel industry. So, in, so I think a partnership is, is really essential for, for, for us to reach the climate goals together. Thank you, Beck. Um, moving to Clorinda, um, so you mentioned that uh, um, um, uh, you uh, looked into the clean heat solution and mentioned the biomass as a like, transition solution. Um, so how, how do you see this uh, um, transition? Um, so is it, uh, um, um, what would be the uh, biggest uh, um, challenge? Is it access to, I think you mentioned access to finance, but uh, um, another thing, uh, um, Meiji, Meiji has uh, mentioned the important thing is the, the policy um, to be in place. So to roll out this uh, uh, decarbonization um, in, in, the, in the context of Indonesia, what do you see would be the, the most important uh, factor? Thank you for the question, Suji. So for um, when we talk uh, specifically on the uh, biomass as the clean heat solutions, there's no issue in terms of the technology itself because it's already mature, the feedstock is already there. Uh, but the, the challenge is one in terms of the uh, policy, uh, for example, on how we can ensure the biomass that being resourced uh, is sustainable. Um, because many of these companies also, they, they don't want to be leveled as, as um, using the fake tech, uh, fake solutions, uh, especially uh, when we talk about uh, the, the brands uh, that, sh that we use every day um, from textiles, uh, fashion company and uh, FNBs. Um, they don't want to be uh, attributed with that kind of like issue. So uh, most of them, they, they use, uh, they choose agricultural waste um, instead of other kind of like biomass sources. Uh, but still, we need to ensure where the waste come from. Um, is it from the deforestation or not? And so those kind of issues uh, that we need to talk with the policymakers. And secondly, um, I think in terms of the financing, because the target audience for this uh, uh, low to medium heat temperatures, mostly from coming from the supply chain uh, parts, so not the big brand itself, because uh, most of these brands also working off with the uh, third party suppliers. Uh, these factories, medium to large uh, factories, uh, that they still have um, not really um, convincing, not, not convincing, but, but they still have uh, need to address their uh, financial capacity, uh, their, even their knowledge capacity. Um, so, so those kind of like actors that we need to work with. And it's not easy for them to tap into the current um, financial solutions, for example, uh, sustainability, sustainability link loan and or also working capital and so on that are being um, uh, uh, provided by uh, the financial institutions because uh, maybe for them pricing is still the issue, the interest rate is still the issue, I saw him smiling here. Um, so we need to think more creatively uh, as at the conventional um, uh, finance solutions or products. Uh, like for example, like uh, can we collaborate together with the principal companies, with the brand to support this, uh, their supply chain partners? Or uh, can we also, uh, like Tristan said, um, uh, leverage more concessional uh, finance uh, or capital to, to help these uh, supply chain uh, partners? Um, so those kind of like financing solution that we are now looking, uh, uh, looking for uh, and uh, research, do the research with uh, several financial institutions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Corinda. Actually, you've uh, um, raised a, a lot of uh, interesting points. So um, uh, concessional finance, uh, sustainability linked loan, um, a number of things. Uh, so in, in from the commercial bank perspective, uh, um, how do you see that the potential, what, what's, what's, what's necessary to um, mobilize uh, commercial financing in uh, emerging markets uh, um, in, this, in these areas? Uh, what do you think? So I think this is a trillion dollar question. 
So certainly there's a lot of challenges, right? It's um, first of all, I start from the technologies. So it's not saying we don't have technologies, we do have SAF, we do have low carbon hydrogen. It's really about most of the technologies, they are still very expensive and uh, they are yet to be tested at commercial scale. So for example, right, SAF, SAF is expected to, um, has the potential to cut down more than 65% of global aviation emission in the long term. But at the moment, SAF is two to five times more expensive than jet fuel. And also I'm not sure if um, anyone in the room has a chance to visit a SAF plant, I did. So if you are there, perhaps you will smell something very differently. So that actually led me to ask a question to our guide. I said, okay, how many days of shutdown maintenance does this plant require? So that tells you why some of the solutions at this moment is very costly. And I think definitely industries need to continue working to bring down the cost to improve the efficiency of their operations. Um, but before we get to zero green premium, I'm also thinking very hard, right, under what circumstance or in what way these green premium and the scaling up risk can be dealt with. We can create a way for the project developers to build up meaningful pipelines and also for commercial banks like ours to really come in and uh, bring our balance sheet support. So I think at Standard Chartered Bank, we see, um, to be fair, a lot of our clients, especially those uh, market leaders or socially environmental responsible companies, right? They have already embarked on their net zero transition journey. They are definitely looking at renewables, they are looking at energy storage. So we are really thinking about, okay, how we can facilitate them on this transition journey. In that sense, we launched um, sustainable finance products as well as transition finance products. So sustainable finance products focus more on um, activities and projects that has um, clear environmental and uh, social benefit or impact. So that includes financing for renewable energy, that includes financing for green buildings, for energy storage. Then transition finance, on the other hand, we actually focus on something that is more, even more difficult. So, our key focus is really um, um, basically to help these carbon intensive sectors to transition away from high carbon activities to um, low carbon, more sustainable practices. So in that sense, we focus on currently carbon intensive sectors. Um, we work with clients from oil and gas industries, from metals and mining, from transportation sectors. So when we evaluate um, um, opportunities, right, we not only look at the decarbonization impact of this proposed um, activity, we also um, consider the client's overall transition journey. So I think that is really important in my view. Um, in that sense, we are actively engaged with uh, developers looking at CCS solutions, especially in Europe as well as North America. As you can understand, there's large government uh, supporting program to provide some risk sharing or even capex subsidy. Then um, in Asia, it's quite interesting that um, we are seeing countries as well as uh, companies are also taking actions. So last month, uh, we announced a strategic uh, cooperation agreement with um, Costco Shipping in China to basically transition um, for this um, container sector. So that's a couple of uh, examples we are working on. And uh, what is really exciting um, that we, our efforts does not stop here. You mentioned about bi biomass, right? I, I'm not going to continue talking about biomass, but uh, one uh, thing I would like to share with uh, the audience here is um, in order for us to support the CDR, the uh, carbon dioxide removal sector growth, we entered into a partnership with, uh, with um, British Airways, Q8, and Ondo. So I'm sure everyone heard about BA, knows about BA. So Ondo is a marketplace for CDR projects, and uh, um, Q8 is uh, an ERW project developer. So not too sure if uh, everyone knows what ERW stands for. Very quickly, ERW is um, enhanced rock weathering. So what uh, it starts with basically crashing certain type of rocks into uh, fine particles and spread the particles over a large piece of land. So when these um, um, silicate rich um, minerals came into contact with um, air and soil, chemical reaction takes place. So uh, silicate minerals react with um, CO2 dissolved in rainwater and uh, form um, bicarbonates, which is washed away into ocean and eventually precipitate out as carbonate. So that effectively um, removes CO2 from atmosphere. 
and start it long term in the form of uh, ocean sediments. So it's all very, very new concept here, right? Then um, that actually, it's, it's, I think that's necessary because for us to um, tackle this very complicated climate problem, we have to think out of the box. But it's always easier said than done, right? No matter how um, passionate I am or the team is about ERW, about pyrolysis, about biomass, every DS2 needs to go through a very rigorous uh, risk and uh, credit process. So I think banks need to learn more about these emerging technologies. We need to understand the risks presented in the value chain so that we can box it and price it. And there will be certain type of risks cannot be digested by private sector. So I think that's where we really hope that uh, regulators and public sector can step in and help. It's really good to hear that Tristan is looking at how we can use blended finance to provide support. Looking forward to have more discussion with you on that. <laughs> yes, thank you, Neen. So potential solutions, new issues and challenges. So that looks like the topic is uh, um, ever expanding. Um, so before finishing, uh, going back to the, the capital market side, uh, um, um, Meiji, um, so you mentioned the importance of uh, uh, policies. Uh, do you have in mind like a key um, uh, policies uh, that have um, like contributed to um, starting off uh, um, financing um, of these uh, um, um, industrial decarbonization um, uh, financing in developed markets? And uh, one quick question is: uh, Is uh, greenium there for industrial decarbonization? Um, bonds, how do you see that? Thanks. I'll start off on the greenium question because it's something I get asked about a lot actually. <laughs> um, so we do tend to see, I mean, a greenium is just a green premium, right? So it's the premium that you get from issuing green versus a vanilla or a, a normal bond. We do see this in the industrial sector in particular, because it's such a nascent market, it's not something that I've got specific data on. Um, but really, the benefit of issuing green is beyond the pricing. And unfortunately, we do have to look beyond the pricing because of the climate crisis. We have to look at everything else. And it's about the resilience of your company and your society that you operate in. In terms of what policy can do, um, we've got our 101 policy paper. And that there's a specific section in there which is all about what industry policy can do. We've seen in Malaysia that they've provided a 2% subsidy for green projects, and um, they've also provided government guarantees as well. So that helps to mobilize finance to where it needs to go. I also worked on the Japan GX program. So it's um, a green transition program, and there the government have actually financed research and development into industry. So they're looking at how to optimize hydrogen in the steel making process. So there's actually quite a lot that can be done. Policy is such a key factor in this. And I think especially with um, economies trying to meet their NDC targets, this all goes hand in hand. It's something that contributes to that overall goal as well. Um, so I do recommend that you read our 101 policy paper because it's got loads of ideas on there. But yeah, subsidies and green guarantees is what can really push this market. Thank you very much. Um, lots of topics, so I have a lots of questions, but uh, I think I need to save time for the Q&A, given the active uh, q and we've seen um, for Jopi earlier. But before going to q and do you have any um, final comment you wanna say no? Yep. Okay, so q and um, yes, please. Thank you for sharing your experience and uh, your wisdom. Uh, my first question is towards Meggy. You showed the big bond market uh, potential of 140 trillion and then the small label bond market, yeah, climate bonds. Uh, has there been some research into looking into why the non-label market has not gone for labeling? Is it because they are not getting subsidies from the government, like in Hong Kong they get subsidies? Or, or is it because uh, they want the Climate Bank of Asia to purchase some of their debt, but also give them technical assistance and they are not getting the technical assistance? Is that why? Um, are they non-green activities or 
is it something different? And the second one towards Clorinda. In Indonesia, there are so many SMEs. Uh, we saw the logos of those large, big brands. But perhaps uh, what you're focusing on is supporting the manufacturers, the actual factories. Yeah. So, so what is the thought process in Indonesia? Would it be something like what ADB has done in China with the $100 million support via intermediary Pingan or Standard Chartered? What is stopping the manufacturers? Uh, are they waiting for? green loans, green bonds to become commoditized and easy to understand so that nobody has to spend hours to understand what's different between ADB and Standard Chartered and IFC approach. Is that what's stopping? Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a great question, actually. Um, I think it's important to note that the green bond market is still relatively new in the grand scheme of things. And SLBs, for example, are really, really new. So it's still something that's yet to kick off. The market likes what it knows. And when in the industrial sector in particular, you have technologies that the market doesn't understand. For example, cement, you have three grades of cement. Does an investor know exactly what the difference is to be able to say, OK, we have confidence that we can put money into this? Um, they, a, a bank might do a bankable feasibility study, which will show, OK, how, how risky is this? Is this feasible? And if you don't have, if you have this new cement, for example, which is meant to be more sustainable, but you haven't built a city of buildings with that cement, they don't really want to spend public, mon public money in that because it doesn't seem secure. However, in saying that, there are development banks out there like IFC who have a massive appetite for this and they want to invest in this. So it is out there. I think it's just about the knowledge and being risk averse. And that's what's happening in the market at the moment. Maybe if I can just come in on that topic, when we meet with uh, clients in the private sector side and we've supported a lot of thematic um, like issuances, both green bonds, green loans, typically we try to use CBI because that's sort of the gold standard because it's aligned to Paris and it requires third party verification as opposed to sort of self-labeled green loans. But of course the finance teams that we interact with primarily, their KPI is to raise capital the most efficient, you know, most efficient way possible, fastest, most liquidity, cheapest, and they're not often talking to or even have necessarily support from sustainability teams uh, in at least emerging markets where we work, we, uh, who can sort of tell them about initiatives like CBI or green bonds. So for them, when we talk to them about it, it's kind of an extra hassle for them to go through that, and it's an unknown and it's a risk, and then they have to justify it to their chief investment officer or their board. So what we've been doing a lot uh, with clients is trying to support like first issuances through technical assistance. So we say, we know how the process works. We work with CBI all the time. We can cover the cost of it for you. Like, don't worry, it won't add any hassle. And actually there'll be benefits. Not, and then they ask whether or not it'll be cheaper and we give maybe a similar answer to the one you gave earlier, but we also mentioned the other benefits. So I think it's also that the KPIs for finance teams aren't always aligned to you know, sort of green objectives. Yeah. Just to comment on that a little bit also is uh, the leadership of the companies will be really, really matters to decide their future investment in this type of technology. So um, to convincing the leadership position in the companies is very, very uh, take, taking times and um, yeah. <laughs> and to answer uh, the question regarding the um, uh, the the biomass itself. Um, so m many of the uh, logo that you saw in our initiative in Cardinezro Hub and CIA are uh, the principal companies or the big brands. But uh, many of these big brands actually 80% uh, of their um, more than 80% of their emissions uh, for light for, uh, light manufacturing companies uh, are actually scope three emissions. So uh, sourcing from their um, supply chain partners. So this uh, small, medium enterprise and many also medium to large uh, enterprise also. Um, however, uh, when based on our uh, survey to these companies, um, many of these companies, they, they don't uh, really understand on how to tap into the conventional um, financing products like uh, SLL or maybe um, uh, working capital or other types of um, finance products uh, that dedicated for 
sustainability so green all type of like green financing so there need to be more uh, technical assistance to help these companies to understand those type of financing products actually exist um, and also when it comes um, to the pricing i think um, there should be a collaboration uh, blended fan Blended finance needs to be there because we always speak about uh, blended finance, but how to actually to realize it to help uh, these types of uh, companies to actually tap into blended finance. So I think commercial banks and also multi -develop development banks needs uh, to work together uh, on how we can think creatively to uh, mo mobilize this type of uh, finance product to these companies. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's all for me. Yeah. So yeah, just very quickly add on to that, right? I think I 100% agree with you. Um, it's uh, sometimes it's also because this emission is scope two emissions to the big names. So I think supply chain emission traceability is really important. It's becoming more and more important. Mm -hmm. And also I think uh, um, not I'm not too sure about other manufacturing um, sectors, right? For instance, those industrial sectors when they decarbonize, it's not only about the companies they can make they can control every asset in this uh, decarbonization journey, right? We mentioned about, yes, mm -hmm. a steel company needs renewable energy supply. So there will be collaboration partners to provide them the renewable energy. And then for certain industries, you will have to use uh, calm capture and storage. But uh, in this part of the world, there aren't a real storage infrastructure system in place. Europe is um, developing it, but Asia, I think it will take some time to get there. Okay, we are running out of time. So uh, one question per person, two more questions. Uh, uh, lady over there, please. First of all, thank you very much for the very interesting exchanges and the quality of your, of your comments. Um, it sounds like all of the institutions represented here are really doing their best and their best share to try and achieve the decarbonization objective globally. So this is extremely good sign. Uh, by the way, I'm EIB, um, European Investment Bank, Axel Bureau working for EIB. Um, and so we, as the EU Climate Bank, we're also trying to obviously do our share and we are in very close collaboration also with the likes of um, ADB on that. My question is not an EIB question, it's an Axel question, so very personal. Um, when reading the IPCC report, I see that the concept of sufficiency or sobriety is actually going to be quite key to allow us globally to achieve you know, the objective of 1.5 or at least less than two. And that ties in with a comment that I think it was the Ministry of uh, Energy of Cambodia that said during one of the opening panels, whatever cannot be, um, uh, what, whatever cannot be saved must be produced sustainably. So linked to that, my question is, if and if so, to what extent is that concept of sufficiency or sobriety at all discussed um, or is at all taken into consideration in all of the discussions that you have with policy leaders and public sector stakeholders and just generally within your respective um, industries. Thank you. Interesting question, but a challenging one. Uh, anyone is that sort of about reducing demand, like not producing more than we need? Is that, I'm not familiar with the concept. Yeah. Um, look, it's it's. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, I'm not really familiar with the concept, so um, maybe I, I probably can't give too much of a detailed answer on that. But if it's connected to reducing demand, of course, that's always the, the sort of first and best choice. Um, but I think the that that's not something. It, we haven't done a lot of energy efficiency investments uh, at ADB, and it's something that's. Uh, challenging uh, to do because I think the, the key driver of energy efficiency is usually regulatory um, uh, because of issues like split incentives and, and just the way the whole market works. So it, it's a sort of very fundamental market reform question that I think through individual investments can be a little bit challenging. I think we can probably do more through our FI channels to deliver finance to uh, you know, end, end consumers to make uh, greener choices in equipment and assets. Um, but I think it's probably a bit more of a policy question. I'm not sure if anyone can.
Um, I heard a comment on it just based on our sector criteria. A lot of principles out there and guidance says it needs to be sufficiently ambitious. You need to sufficiently reduce emissions. We actually give the amount. So it needs to be the um, your emissions profile needs to be X at this year and the next year it needs to be different and the following year needs to be different. So I think we try to quantify it to make it easier, but also give the suggestions. OK, how do you get to that to those numbers and what do you actually do to get there? Yeah, maybe to also add a bit on that also, uh, I think it also uh, shown in our um, national target of energy. So we have renewable energy and also energy efficiency. So um, I think uh, most of the policy right now is really emphasizing on how to uh, increase the renewable energy, triple the renewable energy, but we haven't really uh, focused uh, on the energy efficiency itself. So, I, but I think, I think the government is uh, working on that. Uh, and basically, from the perspective of the industries that we, we are working with, uh, their priority is actually energy efficiency as the first step, because it can reduce their, their cost of production. So the discussion in terms of the uh, uh, efficiency in terms of the energy is always there for, with the industry. But I think the policy uh, from the government need to catch up as well. I mean, I think in steel and cement, like in the building sector, there's sort of a natural incentive to reduce materials but obviously at some point you've also got to deal with structural and engineering constraints so I have seen some you know discussion of just design changes that can reduce the amount of cement and steel um, but I haven't seen that necessarily driven from say a policy perspective and I mean if we're talking to a client maybe in the built environment if that was an area that they were say pursuing and claiming an emissions reduction associated with that uh, I guess then ADB we would also need to discuss internally is that, you know, is that sort of the alternate case that we can count and then we can consider the sort of avoided emissions from reduced material usage. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite a nuanced area, but it's, it's definitely very relevant. Looks like our chair is staring at me. Uh, maybe the taking uh, the liberty as the moderator, the, yeah, the, the last, yeah, the last one is the one Good morning. Thank you very much for the insightful presentations. Uh, I'm Raphael Deguer from ProParco. We've been um, supporting industrial decarbonization like ADB uh, on the solar CNI sector in a few countries in the region, for instance, in Thailand and Vietnam. We see that it's part probably of the solution, but uh, when we hear those industrial clients, it's definitely not supplying all their needs. It's probably providing up to 20, 30 percent of the energy consumption they would need uh, to really uh, um, have a full um, um, green uh, green mix. Um, where do you see the most uh, advanced uh, uh, regulatory framework in terms of BSS storage or direct PPAs? Is there any country in Asia or in Southeast Asia which is probably uh, showing the path to, to take to, um, uh, to have demonstrative pilots on, on, on those specific uh, scheme? Thank you very much. like to take yeah interest um, we'd have a yeah. go at that one so on on uh, BES uh, I think most recently the largest initiative we've seen is in Thailand um, where they announced a five gigawatt renewable program and as part of that there is a one gigawatt allocation for solar with BES uh, and it has a sort of 20 percent capacity requirement for up to two hours so it's quite a significant sort of time shifting component. So that was the first large scale program in Southeast Asia. I, I have only worked and cover Southeast Asia, so less familiar with sort of central uh, and east. Um, uh, so I think that's probably the most significant policy. On direct PPAs, yeah, that's a, it's a, I guess, a key gap. Uh, and that's maybe why you've, you've asked this question in terms of decarbonization of industry, because in a lot of other markets in advanced or high income countries, a lot of these sectors can utilize sort of direct PPAs uh, or contracts for difference to, uh, you know, deal with the kind of electrification side. Um, Vietnam's working on a direct PPA agreement, but they've been working on it for many years, and I think it's always six months away, but it seems to be edging closer. Um, Thailand doesn't have anything too much yet, but is just recently uh, sort of announced and working on a what they call a sort of utility green tariff, which is a bit more like a renewable energy certificate scheme, but it's still kind of 
gives you as a consumer um, the ability to uh, procure renewable energy from, from EGAT. Um, but I think that that's a gap in the market. I'm not sure in, in Philippines there's a bit more flexibility, but I'm not sure how your kind of supply works. Yeah, maybe I can comment on the Philippines because Philippines has a privatized electricity market. So for big users, uh, we can actually have direct PPA with the with the power generator wire. Of course, uh, they are subsidiaries typically with a retail license. Yeah, so in the Philippines, um, most of the big uh, users and users uh, will do that because uh, it gives us, let's say, some choices of shopping around with the power plants. Yeah, I also know um, in in Singapore, yeah, there's also a privatized market. I think that is also allowed. But yeah, in some countries, it's still very much a regulated industry. So so they don't have a choice, but only to buy from the government. All right. So. Sorry for running uh, over time, but uh, can you lend your hands to thank the, the panelists? Uh, yeah.